Hello, this is a short talk on statistics in phylogenetics that um, illustrates the type of research that we do in the lab. For those that are not familiar with phylogenetics, phylogenetics studies evolutionary relationships between different organisms. It is now widely known that, for example, the dinosaurs evolved into the mother day, mother day birds. Uh, but then you might think, well, how, how do scientists really know this? And it turns out that we know this because we have reconstructed what we call the tree of life, which is this massive uh, graphical structure that represents the evolutionary process from the origin of life that is represented by the root of the tree into the huge diversity that we see today that is represented by the leaves of this tree. So you can think of the tree of life kind of like a family tree where you have siblings and parents and grandparents, but instead of all humans from the same family, you have different species from mammals, birds, everybody. So uh, with the tree of life is that we know that humans, for example, are closely related to chimpanzees or the chimpanzees are the uh, organism or the species most closely related to humans. It is also with the tree of life that we know that dinosaurs and mother birds are closely related. Uh, but then the next question is, how do we get the tree of life in the first place? This is not something that we measure. It is not something that we observe. We have to estimate it from data. And then the main question that phylogenetics tries to address is uh, reconstructing or learning the tree of life from genetic data. And to illustrate with this example, let's pretend that we have three species for which we want to know what is the tree that represents the evolutionary relationship between these three species. Normally, we will only use living species or species that are still present today uh, for illustration purposes. I'm putting here the dinosaur as well. But normally, I mean, it would just be uh, extant species. Um, we want to know what is the tree that represents the evolution of these species. And this is one example of such tree where we have internal nodes here in gray, gray that represent common ancestors. So the one here uh, that I'm showing is the common ancestor of birds and dinosaurs. But there could be a different tree. So perhaps the evolution really happened that lizards and dinosaurs are closely related. And that will be depicted by a different tree where the common ancestor here would be the ancestor of lizards and, and dinosaurs. And just by the way they look, you might think that there was such a common ancestor between lizards and, and dinosaurs. So the tree is providing information about who, which species are more closely related to others. So the question is among the three possible trees, that we can build from these three species, which is the correct one, which is the one that truly represents what happened or the evolutionary process. And in order to answer the question, we need to collect data. And what scientists do is they extract DNA sequences from the organisms under study. And then from these sequences that represent simply their strings of nucleotides, ACDT, here I'm just showing a very short, I think has like 10 nucleotides, but of course we think that in real life, we collect much longer sequences. With these sequences, this is the data that we want to use to uh, identify which is the tree that agrees with the data that we have at hand. And this agreement between data and tree model um, is um, measured by the likelihood function. So we can quantify the likelihood of the different tree models. These are our parameters of interest, the trees. And then we have a data that will allow us to calculate the likelihood and then identify which is the tree that maximizes the likelihood. The tree that has the highest likelihood value will be the one that agrees more with the data and will point at what we think would be the true evolutionary history. Um, but then the question becomes, how do we calculate the likelihood function? And the likelihood function, we have to, instead of taking the whole sequence, we need to focus on one side or column at a time. We make the assumptions that each column evolves independently from other columns. And now we need basically three ingredients to calculate the likelihood function. We need to impose a probability model for transition. That is, what is the probability of a different site, let's just say an A mutating to a C or a G or a T that is um, encoded by this Q matrix, the rate matrix of a continuous type Markov process. Uh, we need branch length. So this tree, um, there's some time that passed. So whatever the site was at the root, there was some time that it took to mutate, evolve into the A that we observe today. So we need to know what is this time or, or, this time or estimated. And lastly, we need to know or estimate um, the state of the ancestral 
nucleotides because we don't know. We don't observe what was the nucleotide for the ancestral sequences. So we need to either estimate it or integrate over it. With these different ingredients, we can calculate the likelihood function as a product of um, transition probabilities. So we have a probability of observing an X value at the root, that's P of X. And then we have a product of the transition probabilities that is the probability of transitioning from whatever X was into A in time T1. This is the first transition probability. And then the second one transition from X to Y on time T2 and so on and so forth. So each edge on the tree represents one transition. And then these transitions are obviously governed by the Q matrix, all the parameters in the Q matrix. This is the likelihood model. So for those that are familiar with continuous type Markov model, this is a continuous type Markov model. And this allows us to calculate the likelihood. And now keep in mind that the tree is one of the parameters of the model. So the tree is fixed under this computation of the likelihood. And then with these values, we can um, maximize the likelihood for the branch lengths and, and the ancestral states if we wanted to estimate. Okay, so with the computation of the likelihood, that was just for one side, we assume they're independent, so we multiply the likelihood for all the different sites. And there are, of course, many challenges because for this case, when there are only three species, there are three possible trees. So of course, we can evaluate the likelihood for all three options. Uh, that is not the case for every data set. For example, if we have uh, 52 species in, their, in our sample or in our data, there are more trees than atoms in the universe. So you can think we cannot evaluate the likelihood on each of them anymore. So we have to do different things. So phylogenetic inference is a really rich area of research and it's very interesting um, because it has many challenges. So we, we spend a lot of time as a statistician thinking about identifiability. That is, there are many different biological processes that create the same signal in the data. Our data are the sequences and you can imagine they have only four nucleotides. They are very, they, um, depending on what region you were studying, it could be very highly conserved. There's not a lot of phylogenetic signal. So perhaps even if we want to estimate something, the, the, the signal is not there um, in the data. There's lots of information because of the process, like human chimpanzees, they share a lot of the genome. The origin of life is a billion years ago. And then uh, we we're starting to get into the scary domain of information theory. So there is uh, also not, not simply collecting uh, huge amounts of data, but also um, identifying whether the data has information that we need. And also there are challenges on optimization because this is a non-Euclidean space. Because the tree is a discrete object, we have to search heuristically the space of trees to find the one that maximizes the likelihood. And then of course, we don't have any convexity guarantees. And then of course, there are challenges on scalability. I simply mentioned that uh, the space of trees grows out of control. And then even just evaluating likelihood on different cases can be uh, MP hard. So phylogenetic is a very, like I said, rich, um, challenging area to do research as a statistician, um, but it's very, very exciting as well. So just to highlight for students interested in joining the lab to do uh, phylogenetic um, research, like I said, uh, we are talking about very challenging likelihood functions uh, using non-Euclidean space, there are some space on trees called BHB that uh, have certain guarantees uh, or there are certain properties. Uh, they're not so widely studied yet. Uh, there are very interesting potential collection, connections between statistics, mathematics, computer science, and information theory. And of course, this is an area that is highly applied. I mean, there is work for mathematical development and computational implementations, but also applications to real data. So there are different collaborations going on with all types of organisms from fish, potato, carrot, grass, bacteria, even, even viruses. And lastly, most of what we do in the lab is implemented ultimately in software that biologists can use. Uh, this is one example, Phylo Networks uh, is a Julia package that allows biologists to estimate phylogenetic networks from um, multilocal data. So uh, if you're more interested in learning more about phylogenetics, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to me. Thank you.